What is the financial history of the founding fathers? How did their personal finances affect the Constitution and the new United States? Historian Willard Sturt Randall puts the focus on how money shaped the birth of America in his book, The Founders' Fortunes. Willard Stern Randall, a professor emeritus at Champlain College in Vermont, has written books on Benjamin Franklin, Benedict Arnold, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Ethan Allen. He has now turned his attention on these and other founders and how they made and lost their money. Professor Willard Stern Randall, the last sentence in your book on the fortunes of the founders is about Robert Morris. Quote from him, I now find myself a free citizen of the United States without one cent I can call my own. Who is Robert Morris and why that closing out your book? Robert Morris was called the financier of the American Revolution. He actually was the man who helped organize international trade uh, so that the United States could get, the, the new country could get weapons, gunpowder, all that it needed to fight against the British in, in exchange for um, crops, uh, promised commerce. Uh, he was the man who pulled all that together. He, personally, when the revolution was over uh, and Washington was had a mutinous army because it had not been paid by Congress, uh, Robert Morris himself uh, sat down and with a roll of paper, basically, uh, cut out uh, 6,000 uh, notes that he hand-signed in one weekend uh, to give Washington uh, the money to pay off his troops so they could go home with dignity. So he went from having enough wealth and assets to do that to being one of the three founding fathers who wound up in debtor's prison. You also have this in your book. When he sat to draw up his will, dated July 9th, 1799, Washington was probably worth $17 million in today's dollars, tied up in 51,000 acres of land. Where did George Washington get all of his money? Uh, he, he got most of his money from farming. Uh, but what he did very wisely when he saw that the British merchants, shippers, uh, taxing people were taking 75% of his profits from tobacco. He switched his business model to growing wheat so he could sell wheat to other plantation owners near him. He built ships and began transporting it to the Caribbean. Uh, he fished outside Mount Vernon uh, when the shad were running. Uh, he, he, he diversified business, and he was able to take the money from that uh, and buy more land. He owned about, uh, uh, yes, 51,000 acres. His problem, by the way, was after the revolution, like everybody else, uh, nobody had any money to pay him rent and nobody was buying his land. But he, he still ended up uh, one of the wealthiest men, uh, on paper at least. Uh, although I argue uh, from letters he wrote that he only had to take the presidency, he said, because he couldn't afford to keep living in the lifestyle uh, he had as a retired um, in retirement. So he had a lot of land wealth, but uh, his his cash picture ebbed and flowed. Why did you decide to every time you mentioned the money that they had back then to put in parentheses uh, today's dollars? Well, I thought that using the, the the numbers from the time pound sterling gave the reader no idea. Uh, of what these things would cost or what they would be worth today. And it, it's it's possible uh, to use something called uh, measuring wealth uh, to come up with something like the Consumer Price Index. And I thought that that was much more helpful to the reader than knowing uh, how many pounds sterling somebody got uh, 250 years ago. Of all the people you wrote about in your book, who who turned out in the end besides Robert Morris to be broke? Um, Edward Wilson, Continental Congress, uh, overspeculate, overspeculated in land, uh, lost everything. Um, Franklin lost a lot, but he didn't end up 
broke because the British, when they occupied Philadelphia, trashed his rental properties by putting soldiers in them and uh, looted his house and all of that uh, and, and, and ruined his businesses. Uh, but uh, he did not tank. Uh, Hamilton, uh, while coming up with the whole financial system, famously uh, wound up so broke that after he was killed in the duel with Burr, his friends had to take up a collection uh, for his burial. So I guess you could say he wound up broke. What about Jefferson? Jefferson is beyond broke. Uh, this man, who I think is the all-time compulsive shopper, inherited uh, wealth but also debt, and he never paid down the debt. It just kept accruing and accruing and accruing. Uh, he rationalized just about everything, but he rationalized not paying his debts to the British uh, after uh, Cornwallis's army uh, trashed one of his uh, farms and killed some of his horses. So he refused to honor even uh, the, the, the Treaty of Paris. So he just kept building the debt while he kept on spending. So if if he had paid his, his debts, he would have been a pauper, but he did not. You've written about almost all of these uh, founders at one time or another in, in books. You've got 12 books. But when you approached this particular book, what did you do differently in order to get information, and when did you find new information? Well, what I did differently was start with a, with a, a theory that I disputed Charles Beard's idea that the Founding Fathers were only, only in it for the money. So what I did was set out to, to look at any financial records I could find and any, on any of the, the founders that I was focusing on. So I, an awful lot of good material. I was an investigative reporter, and I, I think you can find just about anything in the public record. Uh, I, I used those skills uh, to look at everybody from Jefferson, uh, by the way, to uh, Washington, what was paid by uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses when he, when he was a soldier. I looked at government records. I looked at private business records. I treated this as, uh, as an investigation, uh, a financial investigation, and, and got past a lot of what had been, has been written sort of vaguely about where the money came from. What I was looking for was what the revolution cost and who paid, and I think I found uh, a, a abundant evidence. Who did you find was greedy? Who was greedy? Um, that's a very difficult question because Robert Morris, by our standards, might be considered greedy when he wrote to another one of the founders who's become obscure, um, basically saying, um, you know, when we take a commission for handling uh, the, the munitions or the cargo, it's helping the government, it's helping the people. Uh, so there's nothing really wrong in, in so many words, helping ourselves to a little bit. And, and so he took 5% commission on everything uh, that was shipped uh, across the Atlantic or the Caribbean. And he also, I think the greediest thing he did was basically get Congress to go along with uh, compensating him for the, the cost of any ship that was captured or sank, even if he only owned a small percent of the cargo. So at that point, Washington blows his top about this man. But then he Morris, I think, redeemed himself when he took over the, the finances of the government and helped Washington to end the war uh, uh, without a, without a, a, a mutiny by his troops. So I think what we would call greedy was just standard business practice at the time. Uh, the thing that struck me most about, about this when I got into it uh, was reading the De Declaration of Independence and what is Jefferson's, what's the first grievance he lists? Um, the king is deprived of, of having any banks or any currency. I did not realize that there were no banks or, or, or currency in, in America uh, before uh, the, the revolution. People were walking around with nine different currencies in their pockets. You know, Madison, Madison, while he was joining Congress for the first time, the livery stable threw out his horse because Philadelphia would not accept Virginia money. So, um, 
some of the what look, would look at like greed now was just the standard practice of the time. Uh, and Morris's assessment of the others, I think, uh, I think I, I would generally subscribe to it is that they were plain, honest men, generally. What else should we know about Robert Morris, and what role did he play besides the money in the creation of the country? Well, the first thing he did when the revolution came was give one of his ships, his best ship, uh, to Washington to form the beginning of a Navy. Then he was chairman of the Navy Committee of Congress, which set about uh, having the, our first frigates built, our first ships. Uh, and then he was head of the uh, Secret Committee on Trade, where he lined up agents in the Caribbean and in, and in Europe. Uh, I think he's really uh, the father of, of, of modern capitalism in the sense that he had an international trading network that he put to work for this new, this new country, this new government. So I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, he was, unfortunately, uh, he, he lost almost everything after the revolution because the British uh, basically ignored the, the peace treaty and began effectively an economic blockade of people like Morris trading with Europe, the Caribbean, uh, or Canada. So he made the mistake so many others make. Most of the founding fathers went into debt uh, speculating in land. And Morris did it on a bigger scale than anyone else, and he wound up penniless. Even though you're a professor emeritus, you're still teaching. What are you teaching and where? I teach American history uh, to first-year students uh, at Champlain College, a small private college in Burlington where I've taught for, for 25 years, uh, because I think... It's terribly important that we get better high schools and better high school teachers, especially history teachers. Uh, we've lost the ability uh, to teach people how to think and how to find facts and recognize them when they do. So that's, that's been uh, my, my reason for hanging in there uh, all these years while, while writing these books. How do you get their interest? How do I get their interest? I tell them stories. Uh, uh, kids, instead of having to memorize or just being able to look up uh, everything online, I, I, I think uh, like to hear a story. Uh, the facts are in there. You identify how you got them. I always tell them my sources, how they can find them. Uh, but it's, it's storytelling. And then encouraging the, the right. I get them first year and I get them before their last year uh, when they have to write their, the, the, basically their senior paper. So I get to see them develop and, uh, and, and then teach them how to write some history. A name that you don't hear a lot of, except for people like you who are familiar with him, is Silas Dean. Who was yeah. he? What role did he play back in the early days? Silas Dean was uh, uh, in the Continental Congress representing Connecticut, uh, where he was a, a, a merchant and shipper with several ships of his own. Uh, he was unpopular with the country party, uh, basically the Puritans, because they thought he had made most of his money by marrying wealthy women who died. Um, but then George Washington married the wealthiest widow in Virginia, so it uh, depends on whose ox is being gored. Silas Dean went to Congress, and after one year of working with Robert Morris on the same committees, working hand in glove, uh, they, they, they helped each other, they represented each other in business, uh, was sent to uh, France first as our first diplomat uh, to help arrange loans uh, from uh, the king and to line up uh, uh, shipping and also to um, foster privateering against the British. He did very well, and he was summoned home on leave because Congress was beginning to split into factions, and he was considered uh, to be too much of a, of a Yankee by the Southerners. So he came home on leave, and as he left, the king gave him what usually the, the, the monarch gave to departing uh, diplomats, and that was uh, a, 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 a snuff box with a king's portrait uh, with a ring of diamonds around them. Well, this put a, a whiff of scandal about Dean when he came back to Congress. They kept him waiting for months to investigate him, accusing him of peculation. 
uh, he refused to accept a small financial settlement and went back to Paris to be, be able to document his case. And his, the unfortunate thing about Silas Dean is his, his, his close friend uh, was Benedict Arnold. And when he heard that Benedict Arnold had uh, turned his coat, um, unfortunately for Dean, he, he wrote a letter uh, supporting the Loyalists, uh, and that uh, turned off people like Washington. So we wound up dying in poverty, uh, in exile in, in Europe. Th- three generations later, Congress came around and compensated his granddaughter and, and exonerated him. But he's one of the lost figures of this time. Um, I, I think he, he deserved a little better. You have a chapter on the Constitutional Convention back in 1787. has a lot of interesting figures. If you don't mind, I'm going to read a bunch of them and then have you reflect on them. Sure. You point out that there were 55 delegates to the Philadelphia Convention, 29 college-educated, 34 trained at law. They didn't all go to school because they read law. Uh, Merchants, farmers, and planters, 13 country lawyers. The average age was 42 that there were eight, uh, bulk of their income from mercantile clients, seven were merchants, four owned ships, 10 principal income from public office, 25 of the 55 were slave owners, uh, one servant to 300 field workers, seven state governors, eight uh, signed the the Declaration of Independence, 15 wrote their uh, state constitutions, Nine revolutionary combat vets, five served Washington at Valley Forge, two college professors, and as you pointed out earlier, the wealthiest was Robert Morris. Fill in uh, the blanks of what you're thinking when you hear all those figures. What, what I think, first of all, is the incredible diversity uh, coupled with so much experience. Uh, these people had either been in the revolution or they had set up state governments or other uh, establishments in, in their home states. So there was an awful lot of collective experience there in, in governance and, and how to set up a, govern, a government. There was also such a such – there were five who were wealthy, uh, and the, their investments in Revolutionary War state bonds uh, equaled – 50, uh, the other 50, 50 people, 50 of them, some of them was down to a storekeeper from New Hampshire whose total investment in bonds uh, was, the income was about $10 a year. And when it was all over four years later under the new government, he was making $12 a year. He wasn't in it for the money. Uh, there was a big difference because of the, the, the individual set up in each state. If you wanted to be governor of South Carolina, you had to have a fortune of about 10,000 pounds sterling, whereas in, in Massachusetts, uh, your property qualification of about 50 shillings could be fulfilled by the, the value of the tools in your toolbox. So it was all that variety of experience, that range. They're all sitting down together for four months and hammering out something uh, that, that they could agree on. Uh, I, th- I think the saddest part of the whole thing is on the question of slavery when they compromise uh, with the three-fifths clause uh, in which each uh, enslaved person uh, counted for uh, 100 enslaved per- people uh, counted. Uh, let me get this straight. Uh, someone who enslaved 500 people wound up with in their formula Accounting as 301 voters, 300 for three fifths of the 500, and his own vote. So immediately, it gave more power to the to the southern members of Congress and gave uh, Congress a, a big leap uh, in, into dependence on, on slavery. Uh, that's what I what I think of. But I still come away uh, with with the idea that Robert Morris had that the majority of them were plain honest men if there was a figure that surprised me and i can't believe i haven't seen it before didn't i guess i wasn't paying close enough attention you point out that the popular vote for george washington in 1788 was 39,624 
white men. 69 electoral votes. He won unanimously. Give us the background on that and why only 39,624 votes. Because it was a problem of property qualification again. Um, and because everybody was sure what the outcome would be. Uh, no, uh, was, nobody ever doubted in the, con- in the Constitutional Convention that Washington, if he would accept it, would be the first president. So nobody was really running against him. Uh, so I think it was almost pro forma that the Americans uh, were, were wanted to make it unanimous. And there were, what, 3.2 million people in the United States then, something like that? Right, but if you take away enslaved people an equal number of indentured servants who couldn't vote, uh, people under 21, people who didn't have the property qualification, women and the Native Americans, you're down to about uh, 60,000 who were eligible to vote at that time. Why were they thinking back then that only white men with property should be the ones that could vote? Well, I think my, my my answer to that is they thought they needed people who were incorruptible. They would have to have enough money so that the United States didn't go the way of Great Britain or Europe, uh, where offices could be bought and sold by the ruler uh, with uh, gifts with more land, with more sources of income. They were terribly afraid uh, that politicians uh, could be bought uh, by bribes, which is which was in one form or another uh, the way parliamentary government uh, was working in England and, and then in France after that. So they were trying to come up with another way of, of assuring uh, that people would be respectable in that they, they wouldn't need the money. They could be good, honest citizens because they they wouldn't need it. In 1792, after George Washington served one term and they had another election, he only got 28,200 votes. And there were a couple more states and it was 132 electoral votes. Again, why was there, from your experience in studying this, why was there no challenge to him whatsoever four years later? Well... Uh, and nobody wanted to get rid of them. I think uh, there were the anti-federalists, uh, but they were they were not they were not organized. Um, he, he he was in such high regard that everybody hoped he would stay on for as long as he would live. Uh, not only Hamilton, but uh, people on the frontier. The, the only objections uh, coming from uh, what might have been a rival at the time. Uh, where people who favored Jefferson later, uh, was that he did not represent the poor, the debtors, etc. Uh, but he had uh, he had been there, the founder uh, of of our army, the founder of founding father of our government. Why would anybody be opposed to that? Uh, the, the, there were just some people who were disgruntled, and they were at each other's throats, Hamilton and Jefferson. But it was about two interpretations of what the government should do and who it should represent. It was not against Washington. And as long as Washington was willing to stay on, everybody wanted him, as far as I can see. So George Washington had all the personal money. And what did he do as president in order to keep it? Did he use the government in any way to enhance his situation? I have found no evidence that George Washington did anything as president to enhance his, his position. Uh, he, needed this, he needed the income uh, so that he could uh, afford the office, more or less, but I haven't seen any, any self-aggrandizement. Uh, he didn't live on a luxurious scale. In fact, he, he, he was almost a Quaker in simplicity of, of, of dress and appearance. Uh, I think the ambassador from England mistook him uh, for a servant at one point. Um, so, no, I didn't see any of that. I think he spent a fair amount of his money. Also, he uh, en- enlisted uh, Martha in his uh, his attempts to uh, meet halfway with Congress, go around the country whenever they had time off from the con- c- 
congressional sessions. Uh, and um, th- I think mostly what he did was burnish his own reputation uh, for being the honest father figure of the country. So he would get in a luxurious coach and uh, travel uh, from town to town uh, in New England or in the South. But then when he got to the edge of the town, he would get out of the coach and get on a white horse and ride through the town, taking the cheers and the waves and bowing and tipping his hat. Uh, he, Most of all, George Washington, who had been born on the verge of poverty, uh, valued respectability. One of my big surprises in your book came in your acknowledgments. And um, when I ask you about the reference to someone that had a big impact on me personally and on our network because she wrote a book in 1970 called The Miracle at Philadelphia. Her name was Catherine Drinker Bowen. She was a Philadelphian, as you know. What impact did she have on you? Kitty Bowen, as she was known in Philadelphia. When I was a young reporter for the Philadelphia Bulletin, I uh, was nominated uh, by Nixon uh, for the Bicentennial Commission, the Bicentennial of the Declaration of Independence. And um, she came into the office in the newsroom and sat with me for over two hours while I interviewed her. And she, in turn, uh, thought that I should be the one who wrote about the story that I was already beginning to work on, uh, which was William Franklin, the, the illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin, the loyalist leader, because she thought that was the last great story of the revolution. She went home, and then she sent me a copy of a little book that she had written uh, on, on, one, on, how to, on wanting to write her own little memoir. And then uh, when I, uh, she, she talked to the, the head of the library of the, of the American Philosophical Society, uh, and I applied for a small grant to work on William Franklin, and she not only endorsed me, she became my sponsor. What was she doing uh, at the time? Uh, she was she was still writing. Uh, she was so this would be in in seventy six. I think she kept writing until the time she died. I don't know what she was working on at that time, uh, but we stayed in touch. Uh, and uh, actually, when she died, I was asked to give somewhat of a, a, a eulogy uh, for her at the first international conference on the loyalist Americans. So we had developed uh, a bit of a personal relationship. By the, but she encouraged me uh, to write uh, and not worry about credentials, but just start writing. And I did. I took, I took her advice. A little bit of background on, on why it had such a big impact on me and C-SPAN. Uh, in, in 1987, 86 in that era, when we were going to celebrate the bicentennial of the convention, uh, I'm sorry, the Constitutional Convention, Warren Burger was no longer uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but he was put in charge of the celebration. Mm-hmm. And a lot of media people were part of a committee that he had formed to get attention for the Bicentennial. And he said to everybody on the committee, and there were lots of people, you must read Catherine Drinker Bowen's book, The Miracle at Philadelphia. So everybody read it, and uh, it was it was quite uh, easy to read and easy to understand and a good narrative, and we ended up using a lot of it here at C-SPAN and actually sold books to the public at a greatly reduced price, but uh, she had a big impact, and uh, I, I need to ask you a little bit more about her. Um, what was she like? She, she was very gracious. Um, she was very tall, thin, and had the the bearing of, of a military officer. Uh, she was so uh, you, visibly upright. She spoke slowly with a, a rather deep voice. Um, so what she she didn't she didn't say anything more than she meant. Um, she listened um, more than she she spoke. She liked to write to people instead of talking to them on the phone. Um, she was very, very humble, I thought, uh, even after Miracle in Philadelphia and her wonderful book on John Adams, which I, I also cite, and her works on uh, 
uh, Lord uh, Coke and Elizabeth in England, even after all of that, her, most of her neighbors didn't know who she was. She was living a divorced woman in the attic of her brother, uh, the head of one of the biggest law firms in Philadelphia. So uh, finally they recognized her and gave her uh, a wonderful party. But she was private, she was dignified, uh, and she was very generous. Did you read Mir- Miracle of Philadelphia? And if you, if whether you did or did not, did it have what kind of an impact did it have when it came out in seventy nineteen seventy? Uh, I I thought it was the ultimate book on uh, the Constitutional Convention uh, when I start, finally decided to go to college because I hadn't right out of high school. I did my history paper on it, and it was rejected because it wasn't considered history. It was written by somebody who uh, wasn't an historian and didn't use uh, enough footnotes, uh, which made me treasure it even more. Uh, And so each time I've written about one of the founders that was all involved in that convention, I turn back to Miracle of Philadelphia. I've never found a fact wrong in it. Uh, Discuss for a moment, because you have been a reporter and you have been a professor uh, you went to Princeton. Did you, get, did you get a Ph.D.? No, I'm still a Ph.D. candidate after 12 schools. <laughs> I, got, I got my master's. I did my graduate work, but I had to make a choice between uh, – I, I was already over 40 years old, the oldest one they had ever admitted to the graduate school. Uh, I, and I had published uh, A Little Revenge, Benjamin Franklin and the Sun. And one historian there, Arthur Link, who was a grand old historian who wrote, I think, 60-some books all on Woodrow Wilson, uh, took me under his, not under his wing, but into a rocking chair across from his desk. And we had many, many hours. And finally, he supported me for having that book accepted as my dissertation. But the department decided I had to be like every other graduate student, take a year to submit a proposal, start doing Uh, I basically turned the book I was going to write inside out and make it a dissertation. Well, that book came out and got a full-page review in Time magazine, and I thought, well, I'm going to take the plunge. So I did not wait around for the Ph.D. Uh, I started writing books. How did you get that full page in Time magazine? Um, I got a wonderful review. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but which which didn't help my case very much with the other history professors at at Princeton uh, because it wasn't the verdict they wanted. Okay, the, but the, you know I owe Princeton a lot because they let me in. Basically, a wonderful professor there, um, Lawrence Stone, uh, a, a, a British-born um, historian, uh, let me come into a seminar. And in my seminar, I was able to do very well. Uh, he gave me the, the, the maximum grant he could from his, his, his fund for graduate students so that I could continue. Uh, and uh, uh, I, everybody has horror stories about academe, but mine is more thank you very much uh, than, than kiss and tell. Go back to what you said earlier, because this has become clear over the years that academics I don't know what words I need to use uh, are they re, they re, they revolt when they think about a book being written by somebody who's not an academic and whether or not they don't have the 100 pages of footnotes and even if they do and they're not an academic it's not it's not real history where does all this come from and where did this arrogance start well, I, for one thing, I think they they don't think that uh, a, a, the journalists uh, are well enough educated or understand the sources, uh, or um, they, they insist on peer review for their promotion, their, their tenure systems, uh, and they don't like to make, make exceptions. Um, but I think this crept in early. Uh, I don't think it began here. I think by the 1880s, American universities were paying attention to uh, German universities and began requiring PhDs. I think the first was introduced at Johns Hopkins, uh, and it became the the trend and the norm. Uh, So um, I must say that there are individuals who uh, 
consider uh, writing and uh, originality and breaking the barriers of academe uh, the right way to go. So I was encouraged, like Catherine Drinker Bowen, uh, by other individuals uh, because they, they saw that I was doing kinds of research and asking questions that the, the committees of dissertations never asked or, or, or didn't consider. But by and large, it was a matter of credentials. And I think that the system hiring and promoting in universities, where you had to pass all these basic steps before you took the next baby step. What have you noticed, if anything, in uh, your environment uh, there at uh, Champlain uh, about uh, the PhDs, historians versus your history, which comes from uh, uh, an undergraduate degree for and uh, do you have a master's from Princeton? I have a master's in history from Princeton, yes. Uh, but uh, it, again, it was it was an individual decision. Uh, the the president of, of Champlain College came to hear a talk I gave. Uh, uh, my wife Nancy Nara and I did a book on the history of a small town here, trying to do a model of what a small town history could look like. And he came, to, I came to the to the talk, and uh, he bought all the books on the table, uh, and then he asked me to come and and give a talk. And and that talk was my first talk for C-SPAN. It was uh, on on my George Washington biography, uh, but he saw. Uh, me as a, as an investment in how to attract and win students uh, rather than setting up barriers. And uh, basically, uh, Roger Perry was his name. Uh, he supported me with, with research and travel money uh, as long as he was president. Uh, but it's come down to individuals uh, sort of to, to break the mold. Uh, um, so I've been, I was, I've been very tre- treated very well. And even though it's a small college and it doesn't have a, a traditional history department, I've had free reign uh, to teach the courses that I thought were important uh, because I want to educate the next generation of teachers. Uh, I, I think I've said before, I think that's terribly important uh, because uh, we grow up very poorly educated as, as citizens. If I had my druthers, I would require every high school graduate to take the citizenship test to know the amount of history any new American citizen did before they were admitted to a college. Let's go back to your book and some of the people in your book. And I'm first to ask you about uh, Benjamin Franklin. How did he make his money? He made his money by being an expert printer with an imagination, seeing the possibility of of publishing the work of an itinerant preacher, George Whitfield, uh, who was coming through uh, with with a it was called the Great Awakening. Uh, Franklin went to one of the speeches and was agog at the number of people. And being Franklin, and I quote this in the book, he walked around the crowd and he measured the size of the crowd and then he divided by two and a half square feet for a person. Uh, and then he said there were 25,000 people there. And that made him want uh, to sign up the speaker. So it was on the sermons of Whitfield and the writings of Whitfield, published by Franklin, that he got into publishing. And Franklin made a, more money publishing uh, than he did uh, in any other way. And he, he reinvested it in real estate. He owned 89 rental properties by the time of the Revolution and was already one of the wealthiest Americans by that time because he had hard property. John Hancock. Uh, Jan, John Hancock was born to, to a poor country parson with no money, uh, and he was adopted by an uncle who had no children, Thomas Hancock, who had the biggest shipping business in New England, basically dominating the, the, the sale of whale oil uh, to England. So uh, John Hancock was raised as a, a wealthy young man. Uh, he went to Harvard. Uh, he went to England for a year, uh, sort of the grand tour of merchants, getting to know the merchants and the bankers that he would deal with. And when he was 26 years old, his uncle turned over his business. Hancock, again, like Washington, diversified. He went away from just one product or crop. And he set up chain stores of products, consumer goods. When his ships went full of whale oil, 
uh, to England. He sold the ships, bought another ship, and brought it back full of consumer goods. And then he trained his clerks to run a business. So he had the first really chain of, of stores in, in, in the country. So he had he, he was wealthy enough to support many of the poor and especially the unemployed as the British blockaded that he was the most popular politician uh, with all due respect to the Adamses in Boston when the revolution came. Who was Sam Adams and how did he make his money? Sam Adams was sort of, uh, there was a wonderful detective series years ago called Columbo, uh, a disheveled detective. Uh, and that's my image of Sam Adams, of Sam Adams. San Adams' father owned the malt business that supplied the malt for breweries to make beer, not the beer itself. But his father also set up a land bank granting mortgages to people who had developed land. England said, you cannot do that. That's illegal. You have to give all the money back. So suddenly, uh, Sam Adams' father was bankrupt. And Sam Adams was at Harvard, and his father said, you can't afford to go on. Sam Adams went on, waiting on table for the other Harvard students. I think he never got over that, and I think he blamed the, the British for it from day one. Um, but he was good at organizing the, the, the ordinary people in town. But he was also good at getting along with John Hancock. They were this unlikely couple uh, uh, worked very well together. Um, but, but when they both went together to the Continental Congress in 1775, uh, uh, Hancock looked at Adams and said, you can't go looking like that, and insisted on buying him a new suit. So I'm not sure Sam Adams quite got, ever got over that. But uh, Sam Adams and John Hancock are terribly important, uh, and neither one of them owned slaves, by the way. James Madison. James Madison was absolutely brilliant uh, from his... Uh, Princeton days, uh, where he won the debates in Latin. Uh, I, I think he was very young as a student. Uh, he he wanted to be in government from the time he was very young. Uh, and, and when he uh, got a chance, he joined uh, the Continental Congress. Uh, he, his closest friend was Jefferson. Uh, all the way through Jefferson's presidency, uh, they were close, uh, uh, living well uh, for 50 years after the revolution. Uh, but he was, uh, he, it's hard to say who was the most brilliant, but Ma Madison and Hamilton worked so well together, you get the Federalist, uh, for example. Uh, so he was a, a shy, he was on the small side. He wasn't very good at, uh, at attracting a wife until one attracted him, Dolly Madison, uh, when he was already in his 40s. Uh, but but I would say he was the real the real scholar of, of the revolution. This is from your book. Writing from Paris, Thomas Jefferson resorted to selling off land and slaves to save his debts. How often were slaves traded and uh, sold to uh, make sure these gentlemen had enough money? I think it was common practice, uh, although they were considered so valuable uh, that they... It was a last resort uh, to to sell an, an, an enslaved person. But Jefferson's back was to the wall. Uh, he wasn't able to make any payments on on his on his huge and growing by the day debt. Uh, and so he tried to sell one of his least profitable um, estates, and um, it, it it didn't work for him. Uh, uh, the, the slaves. Only brought, I think I worked it out, about $42 a piece, uh, which was, from his point of view, a failure. And he, I don't think he ever tried that again, but it just showed how disgraceful uh, the, the practice was. You also said that Thomas Jefferson borrowed money from Madison and Monroe after 1783, after the war. Why? Well, because he wasn't making enough from his crops. He, he was in the same bind in a way that Robert Morris was. Uh, they couldn't they couldn't trade with Europe or with the, the, the colonies of the European countries in the Caribbean. Uh, basically, uh, they were cut off from the sea. Uh, so uh, he he wasn't making enough from from tobacco, uh, but he also kept on spending in Paris. 
uh, and he kept, even when he was Secretary of the Treasury the first year, he rented a house and poured money into into fixing it, knowing he was only going to be there for a year. The man was a spendthrift. Uh, so when he traveled with Madison on a vacation uh, 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 slash political organizing trip up through New York to Vermont in 1791, after the first uh, session of, of Congress, um, he didn't have any money because uh, four uh, four bales of tobacco that he was waiting for to arrive in Philadelphia to sell for the money arrived burnt. There'd been some kind of a fire on the ship. So he had no money, and he was borrowing from Madison. But he was also borrowing from his own enslaved valet who had saved up his birthday present tips and had cash. So I was able to find the records of that on microfilm at the New York Public Library, uh, and I thought it cast a lot of light on on, Frank, on Jefferson, the, the perpetual debtor. By the way, when I'm thinking about it, are you writing another book? Uh, yes, I am. What subject, if you can tell us? Uh, well, I'm very interested in John Hancock. How far have you gotten along in your research? Uh, enough to have submitted a proposal to the publisher. <laughs> and for it to be accepted. So and I, I've put in a full year on it already to get it to that stage. How did Tom um, Paine survive? Tom Paine was ab an absolute genius, uh, but he was absolutely inept at getting along with his boss, whoever it was. Uh, so whether it was Benjamin Franklin or after that, uh, one of the Lees in, in Congress on the Committee of Secret Correspondence. Uh, he was so good at attacking that he never, you know, <laughs> took a look at his own flanks. Uh, so he was he was tolerated in many ways because he could be relied on to write this slashing journalistic, what they called Billingsgate in England, uh, pr uh, prose. Um, so he, he could be called on to attack a political rival. At the same time, he was inventing a new kind of cast iron bridge, which is what he really wanted to do, was to patent the kind of bridge that could cross, say, the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia without uh, people falling in and drowning. Uh, but he couldn't get investors. He went into England. Nobody was, w was willing to do it. So he's kind of a sad fellow in that he was, he was brilliant, um, but... Um, uh, he, he, when he, he wound up uh, being honored only by the French revolutionaries. He was, he was the only American in the Chamber of Deputies uh, after the, Fr the French Revolution began. So uh, uh, a very interesting character. took this quote from your book, and this is uh, George Washington. Uh, I gather either writing or talking to Benjamin Harrison, and I, before I read it, I wanted to ask you, is that Benjamin Harrison the fourth or the fifth? It would have been the fourth. Well, here's what uh, George Washington said. He feared the nation was, quote, on the brink of ruin. Party disputes and personal quarrels are the great business of the day, whilst the, whilst the momentous concerns of an empire, a great and accumulated debt, ruined finances, depreciated many and wanted and want of credit but secondary considerations and postponed from the day to day week to week as if our affairs were the most promising aspect and that i didn't do a good job of reading that but you re, i'm sure remember that quote yes well he was disgusted by the end of his second term i mean he's the one that called uh journalist uh, uh, a collection of uh Petty scribblers, I think, was the exact term. Uh, but he couldn't get used to the idea of being attacked or even criticized. Uh, critic if you're a general in charge of an army, you're, 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 you're not going to be criticized. Uh, and he was not. So uh, he never got over the habit of being the commanding general. Uh, so he, he was very thin-skinned uh, when uh, the, the press began, the press basically uh, uh, Bates, the grandson of Franklin, began criticizing him. Uh, and then you had H Hamilton and um, um, Jefferson setting up political newspapers, uh, and, and Jefferson was always attacking Washington's policies, which really were Hamilton's policies. And uh, Washington thought it was going to bring the country to ruin. He thought p 
partisanship was the worst thing that could happen. Uh, and, um, and he was so disgusted he would not accept a third pr- a term. He wanted to go home to Virginia um, because he was tired of being characterized, uh, I think in his own words, like, like a common pickpocket uh, by, by journalists. We talked earlier about who could vote, who could have an office like a governorship, and how much money did they have to have? It varied from state to state. So uh, each state had a formula. Uh, it was beyond the reach of most most uh, 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 most Americans in 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 every state. Uh, it was a difference of degree, but not of kind. So uh, in in uh, in South Carolina, it, it you'd have to be uh, a mod- modern equivalent of a, of a multimillionaire. Uh, in New Jersey or in New England, uh, you didn't have to have a lot of money. Uh, but uh, it was uh, it was high enough so that you couldn't get people um, bidding for it unless they they had the the wealth to sustain it uh, and and the, and the idea also that they they uh, they would resist bribes so uh, n- nobody poor uh, got to be a governor or a, a member of Congress uh, but there were some who had almost no money like my favorite is the shopkeeper from New Hampshire. Uh, what, until until he got into Congress and got a small salary for that, uh, he ran his own corner store. Uh, so it, if you could get into a public office and you could live uh, on it, uh, well, then uh, it, it, it was worth your trouble. But the, the chief justice of New Jersey was, was very poor, and he owned almost no uh, stock or bonds. Um, it, so it depended on... on the, 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 the makeup in within each, the states were sovereign going into the constitutional. What convention. system have you had over the years to remember all of these founding fathers and what they're about? Um, I think I've been blessed with a, a pretty good memory, uh, but I've also been helped for the last uh, ten or fifteen years by computer files. I have a pretty good personal library, uh, and uh, while well, I can't remember where the car keys are, uh, <laughs> th- this is this has been my air, my blood. Uh, this has been everything. So, so far, my memory uh, uh, at least leads me where to look for the car keys. You've done the twelve books. What's happened to the sale of books over the last thirty, forty years? Ah. Uh, well, the the picture has changed. Uh, I don't know how it's going to to be now. Uh, um, I've relied to a certain extent on, uh, to a great extent, on giving talks, um, talks to small groups, talks to larger groups, uh, getting on uh, a wonderful show like Book Notes, uh, for example, or I could see in one week what difference that made. Um, so COVID has done a lot of damage, I think, to historians' ability to get out uh, and, uh, and and meet audiences. So, but at the same time, it's created new new devices. Uh, the, just as you're using a podcast, I, I I didn't know what a podcast was when I wrote the last book. My wife listens to them all the time, but I hadn't. And now uh, I think it's wonderful because. I can, on my own website, which was something I never had before, I can put these so people can sit and they can listen to a talk I've given somewhere else. So I have no idea what the reach is, but it could be greater uh, and it could be more various. Uh, so um, it's all changing. Um, what I think what has changed most in the last 40 years is the number of people uh, who are writing history. Uh, the number of people in each category of history. Uh, so um, I think that's very encouraging. This is a cliche question, as you'll see. But if you um, we're going to have a dinner party and you all the people you've known that you've written about, let's say you put f- four of them around your table, who would they be? Well, if the table were big enough, <laughs> I'd have Hamilton and Jefferson there. Definitely Benjamin Franklin. I put him at the head of the table because he'd he'd take over anyway. Uh, he would be the most fascinating and 
uh, character and speaker there. I think I would like, um, shocking as it may be, Benedict Arnold, uh, because I think he was uh, he was brash, he was reckless, and all of that. Uh, but he, to me, he, he personified um, the self-made merchant, uh, the fighting man who never got it never uh, got too grand for his men. Um, the personal courage that he had, uh, and I think he was very bright. Uh, unfortunately, he was dealing with not the best Congress we had, the Congress we had after the first and second, uh, which were uh, many of them uh, uh, merchants and local politicians not up to the snuff. Uh, and, and he had a great deal of pride uh, and too much for his own good. But I think uh, he, he would make it a really interesting dinner party to have Benedict Arnold there with Hamilton, Jefferson, and Franklin. Last question, which of your books sold the most? I think Jefferson. I think Jefferson. I haven't kept track, but the first few years, uh, quite a lot. Uh, in the new format, Hamilton, uh, Hamilton, and uh, uh, e-books, uh, the, the new media, uh, very well. Uh, but I'd say Thomas Jefferson. Willard Stern Randall, author of The Founders' Fortunes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Brian Lamb. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.